Prof, game on. Can you see us? Uh, I can see the tops of your heads. Right, it's a bit dark. Um, it's, we've turned the lights off for optimum projector access, but here's some students. Should we give them out a wave? Hello. There's some over there, but they're all like silhouettes. This could be an elaborate series of puppets I've made for myself, but I promise they're all, they're all people. Yeah, I can see there's, there's, there's people there, but I can't see you too clearly, which is probably for the best, because it's <laughs> obviously just freaked me out. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, could we ask for an introduction, please? Uh, yeah, um, my name's Matt Taylor, I'm an illustrator, and I have been for probably getting on 12 years now, since I graduated, and I've been doing this kind of work since 2002, and uh, I spend my days drawing pictures. Okay, magic. Um, where, did you, where did you study, Matt? Um, I went to Buckinghamshire Children's University um, down at High Wycombe and I didn't study illustration, I studied advertising. Yeah, <laughs> classic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, was, uh, it was not, it, it took me three years to figure out I didn't want to work in advertising. So it was, uh, it was a bit of an eye opener. I spent yeah, a couple of years doing the wrong degree. But it, it did kind of show me that what I wanted to do was. Um, I don't know if you know much about like how advertising works, but it's generally you'll have two guys sitting in an office just coming up with ideas, and then once they've come up with ideas, they hand that over to someone else to kind of turn it into an advert. So, oh, is that feedback on your end? Yeah, a little bit, but I'm not sure where from. It's gone now. We've yeah. only got one speaker, so it should be all right. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a uh, like a team of art directors who come up with ideas, and then they hand them to someone else and turn it into like a finished thing. And it turned out what was happening was I was coming up with these ideas, and I actually wanted to visualise them, to turn them into illustrations or into videos or into whatever. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't allowed to because that wasn't what the course was about. And what would happen is we'd uh, get in touch with other departments in the university, and they turn our ideas into finished adverts. And I realised that I wanted to be with these other departments turning things into ideas and visualising rather than actually coming up with the ideas. Yeah. So I graduated and then probably did nothing with advertising. <laughs> Good for you. That's, um, yeah. that's, that's interesting because I'd like to ask, ask you a little bit about how you got from, from anywhere to where you are now in terms of the skills and the way you do things. But we will, we will address that later on. I think looking at the schedule we discussed, the next thing I wanted to know was where are you? Oh, okay. Um, I'm at home at the moment in my studio. Uh, I live in Chichester down on the south coast. Um, yeah, I have a studio in my spare room. I'm just going to lift up the camera. Apologies, please, this is going to be really... Here we go. Uh, I just need to try and turn the camera around. No, almost there. There we go. Ah, nice. You've not experienced this before. This is like the future. Yes, <laughs> the future of teaching. This is um, this is my studio where I work. Um, it's my spare room. I won't show you at the heart of the studio, which is where my wife usually works, um, because at the moment it's kind of an impromptu bedroom uh, because we had a baby ten weeks ago, and so I'm sleeping in here a little. Bit. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but yeah, this is um, this is my setup, uh, including illustration has been happening right up until you called me. Amazing. Um, iMac, Cintiq. Books, uh, shoes on the floor, mm -hmm. extensive book selection. This is where all the prints of it that people buy. Uh, I think that's just about it. There's, uh, that's comics down there, which are waiting to be shipped. Um, and so that's, that's basically where I spent my days. Amazing. Um, it's interesting to see like what you do and don't need. Oh, what? Ah, nice. Okay. Um, I Sorry, I'm back. I, Sorry, camera's been working. Trapped in the matrix. Um, have you, I mean, have you any urges for like more space or um, a different type of studio? Or are you happy? Does this suit the way you work? I quite like working at home. Um, my wife's in Australia as well, so we both work at home, which is which is lovely because we get to work with each other all day. Um, like I said, we just had a baby, so it means that I get to be around her growing up. Um, yeah. Which, if I was going out to work in the studio all day, I wouldn't be, and that's. To be honest, really, really important to me. Um, that's the main reason I work at home. I, you know, I may regret this in a couple of years when she's up and moving and walking around and wanting to draw on every surface and you know make a mess of dad's studio. But for the time being, it's it's kind of important to me that I'm I'm here. Um, it would be nice to have more space. It'd be nice to have 
more room to kind of store prints and you know artwork files and just have a little bit more room to breathe. But to be honest, like I've got a pretty big desk here and I've got room to move around it. Yeah. I've got place, so I'm happy. Did it take you a while to figure out what you do and don't need? Um, not really. It was uh, you kind of fill the space you have. Yeah. yeah. So. The last place we were in had a much smaller space, so we didn't have all the books. Um, much smaller desk, you know. We sort of expanded to fill the space, so uh, we had like stock. My wife uh, designs prints with my t-shirts and uh, things like that, so we've got some stocks now stored in the studio instead of, you know, <laughs> behind a behind a bookcase yeah, somewhere. Um, so you, you kind of fill up to, to fill the space you have. Yeah. Okay. Magic. Um, uh, the next thing I wanted to ask was, do you have any artifacts or treasures we could have a look at? Ooh, um, hang on, let me have a look. Uh, I've got my cannon. <laughs> this nice. is pretty good. Um, this is from the film Coraline. Um, a friend of the family was a uh, was the like one of the first unit directors on it, so this is a prop from the film. I think it was used to fire mice from in the movie. That's um, amazing. And now it was my pencils. <laughs> and we also have, I'm going to hold this up, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this, uh, government property pencils. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can read that. <laughs> these belong to my granddad, he used to work for the civil service. Right. Uh, and these probably date from about 1960s, 90, no, 1950s, 1960s. And uh, they're very, very rarely used. I occasionally use them for just like signing prints, but mainly for decorative purposes. <laughs> okay. Nice to have uh, a decorative pencil. Uh, also on the subject of cool things, this came in post this morning, oh. which is a wonderful book by Killian Eng. Um, it's worth checking out. I'll open it up and just see if I can. He does these amazing, there we go, kind of sci-fi 70s style illustrations. Oh man. Okay. It's really nice. I, I would recommend seeking it out. How do you spell his surname? Uh, e N G. Right. Okay. Lovely. Um, he's on Twitter. He's on Twitter and Instagram. I think it's DW Design. Right. Okay. Yeah. So he's he's worth looking up in any case because he's he's crazy crazy talent. Okay. Smashing. Thank you for that. Um, that's no. a good thing. We should ask that more often. Like recommendations. Maybe we'll come back to more of that later on. Oh, oh yeah. Got a list. <laughs> got a list where you want good artists. Okay. Um, so let's just talk about what you do. Um, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, in fact, if I pull up that website you showed us before. Um, mm -hmm. It's a difficult one to know where to start, but I want to know what sort of artwork you make. At the moment, it's a lot of posters and a lot of book covers, okay. uh, with a little kind of smattering of editorial illustration in there as well. Uh, that, that's kind of the bulk of what I do. I can see you doing something at the moment. So you yeah, me? I'm going to just pull up the, um, the, the web page that you sent us. Um, I mean, it's interesting talking about a, a, a practitioner's folio because I, I've, I mean, I've been aware of what you do for quite a while, and I've, I've, I feel it's evolved and developed with time. But do you think there's a, there's a, there's an underlying principle in what Matt Taylor does, or why people come to Matt Taylor for for work? Um, I hope it's the way that I compose images and kind of color choices because <laughs> I um, when you when you first spoke about. I think there are a lot of people who do work which is kind of stylistically similar to what I do. Um, I'm under notions that I am wholly unique in a way that, um, like say through Miller, who we were talking about just now, he has a completely unique way of drawing that is just a, an extension of his um, his personality. Yeah. And it's it is totally his. But I know that there are lots of people out there who do work which is similar to what I do, um, which is fine because you can't be wholly. I mean, no one's wholly original. Um, but I hope that what brings people to me is the, the kind of way I compose images and the way that I'll I'll kind of frame things. Um, I think that's that's what makes me unique, and yeah. I think that's what separates me out from other people working in a similar style. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I wonder as well. Do you feel that because of the the tools, the media, and the process that you employ, there's a certain and I, and I don't want this to sound in any way offensive, but there's like a ubiquity or there's like a universal nature to the aesthetic of what you do, and I think combined with such dynamic and uh, high impact compositions, it works very well to a to a broad audience. You know, like I don't see your practice as being niche necessarily. Like I think it, I think uh, a lot of people can look at it and go, "Wow," you know, like. 
Do you think yeah, that, well, that, that's that's kind of the point because if you want to do this for a living, you need to make money, and if you want to make money, you have to have people paying you to do what you do. If you do, you know, beautiful, grotesque, ugly drawings that are technically wonderful and that appeal to a small niche audience, that's great. But you might struggle to make a living off it. Yeah. Um, and which isn't to say there isn't a place for people, because there's there's illustrators a guy called Aaron Walkey who's an American illustrator, who does these wonderful kind of Baroque illustrations. And they're super niche, and he's the only person who does work like that. And he, he you know, he actually kills it, um, because he is so unique. And there's definitely room for that. But I think um, making, being aware of what else is out there, and making sure that you're kind of appealing to a reasonably broad audience, I think is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's let's. There's we've got more questions about what you do. Um, you know, you talked about posters a little bit before. Ideally, where would you like your work to exist? Kind of where it does now. Um, I'm really happy with with kind of how the career's going at the moment. You know, works in the right place, and people are asking me to do things that I find fun. Which you know, I you know, I'm 12 years into this career, and uh, you know, the first seven or eight was stuff which. Was paying the bills, but wasn't by and large particularly thrilling. Um, even up until a couple of years ago, I'd say that probably 50, 60 percent of my work was work which was, you know, just being ground out to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm lucky in so far as that pretty much everything I do I enjoy. Yeah. Um, it may not be stuff that I necessarily care or um, put online just because uh, I think you have to be sort of aware as an illustrator of your brand identity, um, you know, everything you put out on the web can be seen, can be found. And I'm a sort of firm believer that you get asked to do more of what you show you're already doing, because art directors by and large are fairly um, narrow-minded in their view. If you haven't shown that you can do a certain thing, they won't ask you to do it. Yeah. So if you want to say, for example, um, I worked at Island Dust for a bit, 18 months, a couple of years ago. And one of the things I learned there was that they kind of mocked up projects. So they decided they wanted to design some illustrations for wine bottles, um, but they couldn't get anyone to ask them to do that. So they mocked up their own versions, you know, printed them, mounted them on bottles, and did some lovely product photography, put them on the website, and then within a couple of months, people were asking them to do that because they'd wow. seen them. Like that. That's very interesting. And I think that's fairly common, uh, unfortunately, you have to show that you can already do something before people let you do more of it. So going back to what I was saying before, if you fill your work with, if you fill your portfolio with work that's the sort of work you want to do, you stand a better chance of getting that work. Yeah. So if you want to do book covers, you you know mock up a bunch of book covers, you know, just self-set yourself projects to do that sort of thing, and show that you can do it, and then people won't won't have to sort of look at work and think, yeah, we like this, but can they do the thing we want? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, going back to what I was saying before that, um, a lot of the work I do now, I don't necessarily put out because I don't feel it necessarily contributes to my kind of brand identity. Yeah. Um, which isn't to say I'm not proud of it, and I certainly would, you know, own up to it, I'm not going to disown any of it. Um, but I can't lose the thread of what I was talking no, about. No, 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 this, you're making like, no sense. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough now to enjoy the vast majority of what I do. Mm. I mean, I think I want to talk to you about um, your your recent comic, the, the, the Great Salt Lake, later mm. on and show some slides. But it struck me that, and I don't know how quickly you made that. Um, I, 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 it probably scares me. Like, what I wanted to say was there was it seemed to me that there was a huge investment of labour into something that didn't seem to be driven for any other reason than, you know, you're coming to Thought Bubble and you kind of wanted to make a comic. comic. And for someone who yeah. seems quite busy commercially, that seems like a big investment, but is that an example of, I mean, would you like to do more of that kind of narrative work? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I basically did that because I wanted to make a comic. And it was because I was coming to Thought Bubble and originally I'd, um, I'm working on a series at the moment and we sort of thought it might be out in November and then it got pushed back and back and back and I was kind of planning on attending Thought Bubble with this book um, to, to sell, and then I found out I didn't have it, and I was sort of faced with the prospect of having an empty table. So I had this idea for the Great Salt Lake, it had been kind of percolating for a, a, a couple of years, sort of in my head, and I just thought, 
now now's the time. I, I had like a rare period where I didn't have anything on for a couple of weeks. Um, and I had a pretty good first half of the year, so I didn't have to worry about how I was going to pay the bills for a month or two. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll throw my time into this. Wow. I think it took about six weeks start to finish. Right, wow. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at that later on. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's some slides of that in there about, I'm just looking on my screen now. It's up towards the bottom. I think there's only two, there's the cover and the uh, page, the page in there as well. Okay, let's. Exactly. Okay. Right. So for people haven't seen it, this is. Um, well, there's a lot of questions in my head about process and how you make work. Um, maybe this is a place to start. If we look at that mm -hmm. cover, can you tell me what tools you've employed, and what processes or sequence of processes you you employed to to arrive at that finished piece of work? Um, let's have a look at this one. This one was a, a bit of a. It was slightly atypical from how I usually work. Um, with the, the comic book stuff I'm doing, it's it's almost all done without reference. Um, generally, I just put a lot of photo reference to, to kind of build positions. Um, but this one, I just kind of drew it quite instinctively. Uh, but it started off, I started off uh, sketching in Photoshop. Um, and then, sorry, I know I'm looking away from the camera. But it's cool, I don't know about it. It's a good yeah. side profile. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, this was all done in Photoshop. In fact, everything I do now is all done in Photoshop. Um, it was drawn directly onto the screen. Um, I use a Wacom Cintiq for as my kind of basically my only drawing tool nowadays. Um, I drew it in black and white to start with, and then kind of overlaid color onto it. So I kind of used the black and white to create a selection, which I then filled with a kind of watercolor texture. Um, which is how you get that kind of wash at the top there. Okay, okay. It was basically drawn, essentially, the way anyone draws anything in Photoshop, you, you sketch down on a base layer, you put another layer on top, drop the opacity down into one flow, and just kind of draw and refine and refine mm -hmm. um, over and over until you, until you end up with a finished image. And can I ask you about brushes? Are you using, like, some, are you making your own brushes, or have you got some fancy <laughs> brushes? No, I don't know. <laughs> we don't have the time and all the skill. Um, no, the brush that I use are by, I don't know, it's going to kill me because I can't the guy's name. I think it's Carl Webster. Yeah, yeah, um, Carl Webster, yeah. Is that, is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, everyone uses Carl's brushes. Yeah, they're the best, they, yeah. They cost like $5. Um, there's not a single reason to pirate them because Kyle doesn't seem to know. I was chatting with him the other day. He doesn't seem to know how many people use his brushes. I mean, I guess he must know because he makes a ton of money off them, but I don't think he appreciates like the people in like, the illustration and comics industry who use his brushes. Yeah. And I, I, I sort of told him a few people, he was absolutely blown away. Yeah. So now I'm trying to get people who use his brushes to tweet at him and just let him know that they're doing it because they're, they're brilliant, they're absolutely perfect. Yeah. And, I think and they're a good kind of base to work from. So, I mean, a couple of the ones I use are kind of modified versions of Kyle's, but uh, they're from the, from the, you know, the Kyle master set. Yeah. Mega pack. No, it's cool. Yeah. So yeah for yeah. people who are thinking about more custom bushes, definitely check out. It's Calty Webster, isn't it? And yeah, yeah, that's the one. Um, there's definitely free samples, but I, like his, his mega pack, like, it costs like $5. Yeah. And there's, like I said, there's no reason not to buy them. When so, you know, I know what it's like when you're a student and you know, you use pirated versions of Photoshop and, and the rest of it. Everyone just does it. In fact, lots of people I know who are very successful illustrators that still do it. Um, but something that costs $5 is absolutely everything not to buy it. Amazing. Okay. Um, well, can we talk process a little bit more? Is there a particular piece mm -hmm. in this folio um, where you could talk to us a little bit more about, or show us some examples about how an image comes together? Yeah, um, the one with the shaving, which is after the sort of American flag, uh, the woman against the American flag, uh, <laughs> this was something good this morning, and it's a fairly good example of like going from sketch to the kind of bones of what makes the illustration to the finished piece. Okay, so you've got the sketch, um, which it has the word care on it. Um, oh, yeah, it's for, it's for the care section of GQ. Okay, so it's right. the kind of um, grooming. It's German GQ, so it's the... Uh, yeah, it's the you know, self grooming section. Right. And this image here is, is drawn entirely just by yourself? Yeah, it's true. No reference? Um, I usually what I do is I have a, like a photo open to one side, which um, I tend to use Shutterstock quite a lot because all the photos on it are royalty free and they're relatively inexpensive. So if you want a good photo you know, you need to look specifically like something, um, I would wholeheartedly recommend Shutterstock. Um, but what I'll generally 
you do is I'll put a browser you there and try to get an idea for a sort of a pose. Um, quite often, what I'll do is I'll make up mock ups of um, using photos. So I'll find a picture of, like, say, a guy's head in the profile and then a hand with a razor, and I'll kind of lay them out over the top of each other just so I can piece together in my mind like a collage of how it works. Um, and then this is this is drawn like straight into Photoshop, and it's this is how I sketch now. Um, and I know I know it looks sort of complicated, but it really isn't. It's um, I find if I work in colour at the early stages, first of all, it gives the client a really good idea of what they're going to get to the finished piece, and there's less chance of them having problems when you get to final arts. Um, but also, it helps kind of work out the balance of the image and the. Um, yeah, to balance is the best word of you know how the colour works together and what areas you're going to need to draw, what areas you're going to leave whited out, um, stuff like that. Yeah. But the, something like this probably takes about 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of time researching and you know trying to find the right images beforehand, but the actual sketching is a very quick process. Mm -hmm. um, so then this goes up to the final see, which is nice. Um, and then we go up to the second image, um, which is the one after it, which is. Uh, basically, this was the, the photo, the, I think this is three, no, two photos um, laid up together. So it's the guy with the razor, um, some shaving foam, which can be a separate image, and then the guy in profile, which I use for kind of working out light sources and so on. Right. right. And basically what I do is I, I tend to take the photo, I will um, duplicate it a bunch of times, then run it through a bitmap filter so I get plain black and white. And it helps kind of isolate the areas of like intense shadow tones and highlights. Mm -hmm. um, so then I'll, I'll put this on the bottom layer of the drawing and whack it right back so I can keep kind of turning it on and off to kind of just get an idea for whether it's um, whether it's working basically when I when I start drawing up. Um, and then we go to the next image, which is the artwork. It's not finished. Um, I'm going to do this after I get off this call. Uh, but this is this is how it's looking now, and right. yeah, I mean you can see clearly from this image to the last how I've kind of worked off of that and all yeah. sort of areas of my life, yeah. um, which I guess in some respects is tracing. But then uh, I don't know. I think, lot, I think a lot of artists do. Yeah, no, uh, and I think there's, there's, I think going back to your first answer about your your kind of practice or principles in your folio, that the, the, it's the knowledge. In my mind, it's the knowledge of your composition and the balance of colours and the, the power. You know, that foam, to me, like, really jumps out, you know, that's... And again, mm. that red and the blue, it's very simple things but very effective. And I think it's the design thinking and the planning ahead. You talk about 20 minutes to do the rough, but the, the time invested before in thinking and planning, it, it really, I think, underpins where I think the successes are in this. What I'm interested in is, is it all brush? Like, the, you know, there's a crispness to the hand do you have to very carefully draw like the edge of the hand and then you just fill yes. it in so it's flat? Or... Yeah, basically. Um, well, what I do most, um, most of the times I'll do it uh, 600 dpi, so right. it's super crisp. Um, but then I tend to work with like, a reasonably small, like a 20 pixel brush, um, and then I'll, I set, um, sorry, this is getting really photoshop tech. That's oh. interesting. Uh, but I set it to a dissolve so that you don't get any anti-aliasing around the edge of where you draw the brush lines. So it means when you want to fill it, it fills in cleanly. Um, it's, it's kind of a screen printing sort of technique that I use because when I'm doing what that's going to be screen printed, if you have anti-aliasing, it kind of messes up where you uh, select the colors to draw the screens out of. So if you do it with like dissolved edge, it means that you just get the, um, you just get like a pixel edge rather than anti-aliasing. Right, okay, and you can set dissolve in the um, uh, in the drop down. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, sorry, I'm just looking at the screen now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's at the top, so if you go to the brush setting, um, it's on the mode, it's got normal, and then dissolves the second one down. Right, that's really useful, thanks, man. We're, we're, it's yeah, all right. We're, um, all about sharing the knowledge. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, let's talk more about drawing in general, because I think there's mm -hmm. another thing here that we kind of are really whizzing by, and that's that you you are a draft person and drawing, you know, clearly is something that you've developed. Where's your, your relationship with drawing come from? What's informed it? What's, what's good practice for you in terms of drawing? Um, I, to be honest, I don't draw, like, draw, draw as much as I used to. Um, partly because I'm always working and I don't get that much time to sit down and draw kind of for myself. Um, to be honest, it's just practice. Like, I've always drawn since I was little. Um, I've always drawn and... 
this is just, it, it's not, not nothing, it's 10,000 hours, you do it long enough, you get good at it, basically. Um, I mean, I'd like to think I had some sort of natural aptitude for it, but, you know, my dad was pretty good at drawing, and I sort of learned at his, his, on his knee, basically. He drew pictures for me, and I'd try and copy them. Um, and since then, it's just, it's just, just keep on drawing and work at it. Um, I don't think it's a shortcut, unfortunately. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, in terms of graft and putting the hours in, do you find yourself um, like with an un like an unlimited reservoir of motivation, or how do you keep yourself going? You seem pretty prolific. Um, it's, my, it's my job. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something which, uh, and again, something I was talking to you before about um, illustration, something that it relates to me, is that like, this is a job at the end of the day. Um, I think it's very easy to fall into the trap of being a stereotypical artist and talking about things like creating that block and uh, you, you know you're not a fine artist you're a commercial illustrator so you, you, you've got to do it you know it, otherwise you're going to end up making clients angry and then you won't have any clients yeah um i mean i love it I and mean, don't get me wrong you know it's the thing that i love doing more than anything else which is you know why i've ended up in this career but like it is a job and um, I think, I mean, I work longer hours than friends who work in offices, but they kind of have quite a sneery view of an artist, especially someone who works from home, that you, you know, get up at midday and sit in pyjamas and, um, you know, play on the Xbox and don't do anything. But yeah. it's, a, like, it's a serious thing, you know, and if you treat, if you take it seriously, people will treat you seriously. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. I'll yeah. tell you, what's, what's your, what's your, gen, your average day, what sort of hours you do at the desk? Um, usually in the studio by nine, work until lunch, um, take sort of half hour, 40 minutes for lunch, usually works for about half six in the evenings, and then knock it on the head. Um, to be honest, my schedule is a little bit looser now because of our baby, yeah. um, so it's, it's a little bit easier to, um, to find an excuse to sort of stop and go downstairs and see what she's up to. Um, but no, I normally do like a nine to five day or nine to six day. Um, and actually that's something, again, when I worked at Island Dust, that um, really like, completely changed my work ethic because they work long hours and they work hard all day and they turn out so much work. And I went from, um, before I worked there, being you know, reasonably successful, reasonably prolific, to coming out the other end and I was thinking, God, there's so much more I could be doing with my time, I could be producing so much more work. Um, yeah. So I do. Yeah. You know, if, if a job's not due until Friday, I used to be the kind of illustrator who would leave it till Thursday before thinking about starting it. Whereas now, a brief comes in and I'll get to it straight away because if you can get out to the AD three days early, then fine, you can invoice jobs out the door and you can get on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, hmm. Do you feel um, do you feel like your work is still evolving? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, actually, I found since I started working on Cintiq, it's changed sort of immeasurably, really, because I think, again, you can be kind of limited by the tools you have, um, or you can kind of reach the limits of what you can do with the tool. Uh, up until I started working on Cintiq, I was using um, just like an Intuos tablet, and the kind of disconnect between the drawing on the screen, the drawing on the tablet, and what's happening on the screen was. Uh, it meant there's limits what I could do, but when I went over to Cintiq, it's kind of infinite detail because you were literally drawing straight onto the screen. Yeah. And I feel that that has meant that my work has kind of moved on and become probably more intricate in the last year than it used to be. Yeah. Certainly, um, the, um, the gallery that I gave you was sort of top, um, just how we get now, that excluding the first image, which is lost in translation poster, which was kind of a signature image for a while. The first four or five pieces on there are a couple of years old, and I think you can see in them that whilst they still have the same, um, they still have my handwriting in terms of colour and composition, there's a lot less detail there. Yeah. And that was, that was partly down to me finding the limits of what I could do with the tools I had. And then, like I say, once I jumped into the Cintiq, it, it changed. Um, Even though you can see the through lines from what I was doing then to what I'm doing now, yeah. it definitely moved on. And, I can see it moving on again. I mean, I'm sure at a certain point I'll get tired of doing really, really detailed illustrations and want to strip it back and do something super simple again. Mm. In fact, I can almost feel that kind of coming on now. I sort of feel like I'm reaching saturation point with the kind of intense detail in things. Um, in fact, the last image on the um, on the gallery, Back to the Future one, um, which is something I'm working on at the moment. Um, I'm just going to put it up on the screen to work. Yeah. 
is I don't know, it's taken me ages to do it and like in my mind it's reaching a slightly too intense level of detail um, to the point where I'm getting frustrated that it's taking so long. Yeah. It's and whilst I'm happy with it, I can sort of see myself maybe, you know, six months, a year down the line thinking I'd like to try something a bit simpler, yeah. a bit more kind of bold and graphic again. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned Drew because in his lecture he gave before Christmas he was he showed us this evolution of things getting more and more psychedelic and far mm. out, and then he just had had enough and he started to like strip back again. And it's it's interesting because both of you are working digitally, and I, I suppose what I, I recognise in his practice and yours is, is still this knowledge and skill and craft about making pictures primarily with the skills following or all, all the technique, the, the, sorry, the Cintiq, allowing you to do all sorts of mad stuff. But do you still have to have a word with yourself about keeping it human? You know, like how do you yeah. maintain that? I don't know. I mean, I actually find the given that the Cintiq is like the most technologically advanced drawing tool you can get, I feel that actually it allows the most hand-drawn feeling yeah. um, style of artwork. And so I used to use Illustrator a lot. And Illustrator, you really have to fight with it to make it feel hand-drawn because yeah. um, it does, by its very nature, feel very sort of computery. You know, it's what people think of when they think of digital. <coughs> And I think that, um, you know, with the wealth of kind of brushes and things that, um, you know, people like Kyle make for Photoshop, it means that you can achieve that kind of hand-drawn aesthetic, you know, and it's, it's never going to be quite as good as actually drawing something by hand, but it is um, as close, I think. And I think actually the, the improvements in technology are a good thing because they allow you to make something that looks like it was hand-drawn, <coughs> but it's uh, ecologically a bit sounder because you're not tearing through parts of paper. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Um, what would you have said to yourself when you were a student? What's, Ooh, you... Don't work for free. Okay. Yeah, don't work for free. Never, never, never work for free. Um, the only, I'm trying to think now, the, the only exclusions to that rule. Whilst you're still at university, um, is DNAD still a thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay, DNAD. Um, God, what's the other one? Do YCN still do their students' yep, yep. briefs? Yeah, okay. Um, things like DNAD and YCN, I'd say, are worthwhile because they genuinely do get seen by a lot of people. And they are, to all intents and purposes, live briefs. Um, so, yeah, I think those, those two are fine. Um, if you're doing charity work, I think that's okay to work for free. Um, but if anyone <coughs> along, the point, uh, along the line of the project is making money and you're not, then you're being ripped off and you're devaluing yourself by extension other illustrators. Um, it's, it's, it's like my, my biggest bugbear, basically. Um, people working for free or for exposure, which uh, is, is a word I hate more than anything else. But it's, it's meaningless. There are so few jobs that I've done which have actually genuinely got me exposure. Um, and usually it's just like little carrot that's being dangled in front of you. Um, the same goes for design competitions, like by and large I think that they are a bad idea and they should be avoided at all costs because someone, it's, it's basically spec work, you're being asked to create something for free um, on the like promise of maybe getting a prize and it devalues what you do to the point of being a hobby. Like if illustration is your hobby, then yeah, fair enough into competitions because why not? It's, it's it's not your job, but you know if you allow people to think that doing competition or running competitions and asking people to work for exposure is an okay thing, then they will carry on doing it, mm. and it hurts the rest of us because if someone can get something for free, then they will. They won't pay someone else to do it, no matter how good the other person is. Yeah. And I think I think it's something which isn't like hammer home enough as when you're a student is just like really appreciate the value of yourself. Yeah. Like you've got a skill, you've got a real skill and you don't, you shouldn't, don't give away free something which is, you know, which you've worked at. Mm. Uh, you know, you wouldn't expect a plumber to come around and fix your, your pipes for free on the promise that you might tell your mates about what a great plumber he was. And it should be no different with creative industries. But because, um, because people, look at what we do and they think, oh, they enjoy it, they think it's okay to, to ask for something, nothing. And it's, 
it's awful. It's the thing that blights our industry more than anything else, yeah. I think. And uh, yeah, the, there's one other bit that I, I think the only other bit of advice that I'd give to myself is um, it's better to be consistent than trendy. Mm. Like it's all very well being like super hot, and super popular for a little while, but I'd much rather take a long-term career where you are consistent and reliable yeah. than being the flavor of the month for six months um, because it will dry up and you'll have to look for something else to do. Mm. I think it's interesting when you, you say that and we look at your work because I think um, going back to before about knowledge, it seems like knowledge and thought and, and craft is what underpins your practice more than sort of stylistic trends or memes or whatever, you know, and, and I think yeah. that's where the longevity has come so, from and, you know, crack on. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the work that, that you're looking at now is only covering like the last sort of four or five years. Before that, I tried awfully hard to be very trendy a lot of the time and it was dreadful. I did awful work. Um, no one was interested in, in, in buying what I was doing because I was just, you know, I was looking at like Kate Moss. Kate Moss was super hot. Was it like early 2000s? Yeah. And I was like, man, I was looking at triangles in my work and yeah. I've got to draw owls and. Um, owls are still trendy, man. Don't bash the owls. Yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you know, the owls are fine, but it's, it's that jumping on the band package thing, you know, yeah. and it's, it's really easy to do. And um, it's it, it's fine to kind of do it as part of your, your process and kind of work through it, but I think it's good to find your own voice and, and just make. What you do, make, I'm not sure how to word this, just become really good at the thing you do rather than trying to be a cut price version of someone else. Yeah, that sounds great. Although, having said that, I do get a lot of work that Ollie Moss turns down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ollie. No, it's fine. I know Ollie's afraid, but he throws things my way as well, so it's, it's fine. But you know, I know that I have sort of certain tendencies that kind of lean towards his style as well, so, you know, no one's wholly original. Um, is there any questions from the floor? Anyone ask any questions from the same as well? Yeah. How do you come up with your colour schemes for your pieces? Oh, um, I use a, a tool called uh, Cooler. In fact, I'm not even sure it's called Cooler anymore. Um, hang on. Sorry, this is really boring. I'm going to Google it now just to make sure I'm giving you the right information. Shall I? If you tell us how to spell it, I'll open it up. Oh, it's changed. Okay, it used to be called Cooler, now it's called Colour. Um, American spelling, so it's color.adobe.com. That's color just with an R. Uh, C O L O R dot adobe.com. I was going to open up on my screen, so we're looking at the same thing as well. Okay, talk us through it. Okay, this is, this is one of the greatest tools in the world. Um, if you look at this screen, you can see in the top uh, right hand corner there's a little photo, uh, a little camera icon. Yeah. Okay, so that's a create for image. So you click on that, and then if you like, if you find a photo you like, or anything, any image you like, um, and you upload it to this, it will kind of create a palette out of it. Okay. Uh, I'm just doing it at the same time as you. I'm, I haven't got many photos on my desktop at the moment. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, um, and then you can kind of go through it so you can have um, like bright versions, uh, muted D, you know, you can see all the options on there, like reading through to you. But it's, it's insanely useful, and it's um, so normally what I do is I'll go through Tumblr and you know, usual aspirational blogs, and I'll pull off images that kind of speak to me in some way that I think that's got an interesting tone to it, mm. and I'll just stop them. And then when a project comes in, I'll sort of try and link it with the photo that I found previously and then I'll run it through Cooler just to generate like a really nice, you know, five colour palette and then kind of ex extrapolate from there some additional colours to add into the skin, you know, maybe add in a, um, a bright kind of hot colour to go against the colours which are there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, this, this is my my favourite tool and I'm sort of slightly loath to, to share it with everyone. But, <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, you know, interestingly, I suppose... Both Say it again. It's all about finding the right photos. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great images to take colours from. Well, that's what I was going to say. Do you ever, uh, have you ever sort of <laughs> taken your own photographs or put your own stuff into it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, you, everyone has an iPhone or similar, so you always have a camera in your pocket. So yeah. if you see something that interests you, you just kind of snap it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've got thousands and thousands of photos which are just sort of waiting for the right project to come along. <laughs> I mean, the irony is I end up going back to the same four or five palettes most of the time because they are my favourites, yeah. uh, but it's it's very helpful. I mean, the um, the shading image that we were talking about earlier, 
that one was um, that needed a very different palette. Uh, my usual colour scheme because the client specified they wanted it to be different to the one I gave last month, where I already used my usual colours. So I, you know, went into the image folder and tried to look for something that was, um, you know, suitable basically, yeah, yeah. and I deliberately looked for an image that was kind of against my usual usual palette. Amazing. Um, any more questions from the floor? No, we're all good. Uh, all right. Um, I wanted to end then, Matt, with asking you about the difference between uh, illustration and great illustration. Uh, Ten thousand hours. Right. Okay. Just work. Just work and work and work and work and work and keep drawing. Um, it's you know it, you never reach an end point. It's uh, a constantly evolving skill. So. Keep drawing and and you'll get better, basically. Okay, we love that. Thank you. It's uh, no easy to take on. Um, I think we've got one more question here as well. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, so you were talking about, I'm not quite sure what place it was that, anyway, like, I was up, that place where you sort of, how you improved your work ethic, you know, how you sort of got yourself into that situation where like, okay, we did get up at nine, I'm not going to stop till six. Was that something that came gradually or did you find a specific way of getting that? Um. Did you always have it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I had to work out it. Um, it was I Love Dust we were, I was talking about design studio based down in South Sea, which was where I uh, where I worked. But I think I don't know, I just, yeah, it's really hard basically. Um, especially when you work yourself and you work from home, it's very easy to sort of be slack. Um, it's when you're a student it's very easy to be slack. And yeah, I think it's like Anything you get to a certain point, I think that sort of means you start taking this a bit more seriously. And, uh, you know, for me, like, in my head, the kind of office hour mentality was something that I just felt I needed to, uh, I, I needed to try and stick to. And, you know, being on of dust was just, just such an eye opener because uh, they really do treat the distribution like a production line, um, which, you know, is the furthest thing away from the that kind of stereotypical image of the artist as the kind of tortured creative who, uh, you know, labours over every every sort of detail, every little intricacy. You know, there it was very much a case of get the job in, get the job out as quickly as possible to make it cost effective. And you know, I think that's something which uh, young illustrators should certainly think about. I mean, you know, you're young. You, got the time to make mistakes and sort of find your way of working. I certainly wouldn't you know, be so bold as to say that this is the way for everyone to work because, you know, it's not. But it worked for me. And it works for a lot of other constraints, I know. Um, I don't know that answer the question. The no, 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 no. That's good. Okay, Matt, this is great. Um, I think what we'll do is, uh, is uh, thank you with a, with a round of applause and a, a goodbye. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. There's a wave from everyone. Yeah, I can sort of see it in blur. Um, and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day, um, the rest of your month, the rest of your year, everything else ahead of you. Um, we'll be in touch soon, but thank you again. We've, we've really enjoyed speaking to you. So, great to speak to you as well. Okay, cheers, mate. To so, thank you. Bye. Oof. And.